All right, so you all should be seeing the um, allowing to record. So welcome everyone. As most of you know, I think my name is Marissa Bluestein. I'm an assistant director at the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. My colleague Kia Hayes is somewhere in the gallery as well. Um, together we run these monthly training programs and meeting programs for lawyers who are involved in post-conviction litigation and investigations through a grant with the um, Bureau of Justice Administration. We are a TTA provider under both the Upholding the Rule of Law and the Post-Conviction DNA grants. Um, so I say that to say that if anybody here uh, is a grantee and you haven't been in touch with us or you haven't been, uh, or you have a need that we can help with, please feel free to reach out. I'll make sure to put both Kia and my email addresses in the chat uh, before we're done. So these meetings are held on the second Wednesday of the month from 2 to 3, 15 p.m. We invite people to come in who have topics of interest to folks who are doing this kind of work. I am so, so happy to have this month um, my friend Kimberly Moran, who is uh, the director of forensics at Rutgers University in New Jersey. I've known Kimberly for more years than I really want to know. Um, I, we came to uh, work together when I was at the Pennsylvania Innocence Project when Kimberly was at Arcadia University, but she's a renowned forensic scientist. She does work in this area, both um, with prosecutors, law enforcement, with defense counsel. She's an extraordinary resource. And one of the her particular areas of focus is on fingerprints, both in collecting, analyzing, and understanding the validity and how far that the um, technique can go and what its limitations are. So I asked her to be with us today to talk to us about fingerprints because they're coming up more and more and more in people's cases, uh, particularly in cases that are very old and the thoughts are coming up about, do we want to test this? What kind of validity can it have? What's the, what are the limitations? So Kimberly, I, I cannot thank you enough for being with us. You're just the perfect person to have with us today. Um, Please feel free, please remember to mute yourselves. I will go ahead and, and do that for folks I can. If you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat. Kimberly will be monitoring the chat both. So we will make sure we get to all the questions and we'll try to leave some time as well at the end for open questions. I do wanna put people on notice. We will not have a meeting next month. Um, he and I are gonna take the month off, but we will be back in September. So Kimberly, Professor Moran, thank you. I hand off to you. Great, thank you. Uh, well, I'm so happy to be here today and I'm super happy to be talking about fingerprints because I love fingerprints. I work with fingerprints all day long. Um, in that profile picture that you just saw, you might have noticed that there was a bunch of bones in the background. Um, that's because my, um, uh, my background is actually in archaeology. I'm originally an archaeologist and somewhere along the line I got converted into the world of forensic science. Um, but going back to my archaeological research, my um, PhD uh, research was in the field of ancient fingerprints. So I was looking at fingerprints that were on objects sometimes 5,000 years old. Um, so it's exactly the same sort of processes that we would use for modern fingerprints. They just happened to have been around a lot longer. So I'm really happy to share a little bit about fingerprints today. I'm just going to real quick pull up the chat and put it on my other screen just so I can monitor it as I go along. Um, now, this really is all about fingerprints. I'm going to really kind of start from the basics. I hope that's not too boring for everybody, uh, but we're going to kind of build on it and talk about kind of the strengths of fingerprinting, but as well as some of the challenges with fingerprinting as well. So first of all, if this is going to be all about fingerprints, we need to start with our basic definition of what is a fingerprint. Um, so whenever you look at your hands, and you can be looking at your hands right now, I can't see whether you're looking or not, but you'll see that you've got lovely little lines all over your fingertips. These are called friction ridges. And friction ridge skin is a special type of skin that is only found on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And kind of as you examine your hand, you'll notice that as you come around to the side of your hand, those ridges really kind of abruptly come to an end. So it really is a specialized structure. And there's a genetic underlying component to this, which is why we have some genetic disorders where people are born without friction bridge skin. We kind of hear about in the news when somebody tries to like fly to Orlando to Disney World and they can't fingerprint him at the airport because he has no fingerprints. So whenever you come into contact with a surface, you are, we are all kind of very sweaty people. We are constantly secreting various fluids all the time. And when you come into contact with a surface, those secretions are left behind in the pattern of your friction of your friction ridge skin. And that is what we're examining in forensic science. Um, they are really the ultimate form of identification. We have never found, I'm gonna say this correctly, sometimes you'll hear examiners saying, you know, no two, no two people have the same fingerprint. 
The correct way of saying it is we have never found two different people to have the same fingerprints. You know, we can't fingerprint every single living person that there's ever been, but we can say of all the people that we have fingerprinted, of which there are hundreds of, of millions at this point, we have never found two different people with the same fingerprint. Um, however, with DNA, there is a way where you can have two different people with the same DNA. Can anyone write in the chat how you would have two people with the same DNA? How could that be possible? Twins, yes, very good. Genetically identical twins will have the same forensic profile in their DNA, but their fingerprints are different. We have extensive twin studies to show that their fingerprints are different. So it really does make fingerprints the ultimate form of identification. There are other kind of things, other marks that we leave behind that are unique. Your lip prints are unique. Your ear prints are unique. Um, and other things, the shape of your sinuses in your skull is unique to you. Uh, but none of those are quite as useful for forensics as, as fingerprints are. Now, there's lots of things that um, your fingerprints can't tell you that DNA could potentially tell you. So, uh, and I put question marks by some of the things in just a little bit. So your physical description, what you look like, your phenotype, fingerprints will not tell you anything about that. However, we are developing DNA technology. Some of you may be familiar with Parabon and some of these other companies that are producing the phenotype of somebody based on, you know, various markers in their DNA. So DNA can do that, fingerprints can't. Fingerprints in a traditional forensic sense cannot tell you the age of the individual. Now I've put a question mark here because there are a lot of people who are kind of working on this aspect. Um, your fingerprints do not change um, unless you have a scar or um, you've done some serious damage to the underlying tissue. The pattern that you are born with, in fact, the pattern that develops before you are born is the same pattern that you will have when you die. But that pattern expands. Some of you guys maybe in middle school did that experiment where you put like an inked fingerprint on a balloon and you blow it up. That's essentially what happens as you grow. You start with this tiny little pattern and it gets bigger. So there are lots of people that are trying to measure the spaces between the ridges to see if that correlates with age. But there are lots of problems with this. I mean, first of all, we just don't have the kind of population studies to show that this is a thing. In archaeology, they say it's a thing. They try to do it all the time if you look at ancient fingerprints. But I'm always the, the reviewer that says, this is not a thing. You cannot tell age. Sex of the individual. Um, again, I put a question mark because it does appear that women have more ridges within you know, a square millimeter. We call it ridge density. Uh, than men do. There does seem to be kind of like a sexual dimorphism. But again, the studies are pretty small. I think the largest study out there had 500 participants. That's really not big enough to say definitive, definitively that this is something that you can do. However, we do have really good research that says the secretions that we give off as males or females have very different chemistry. So you could test the secretion that was deposited to tell you if it was male or female. And then finally, race or ethnicity. Um, fingerprints do not tell you anything about that. Again, I've put a question mark because we do seem to find some clustering of uh, loops being more prevalent in Asian communities, worlds in um, folks of African descent, uh, European descent tends to be more arches. But again, the research is super flimsy on this. A lot of the research is, you know, really entering the realms of just being purely racist. And fingerprinting has a has a long history of having lots of links to racism and um, the phys physical anthropology and some of the very racist things that happen in physical anthropology as well. So, you know, again, I would say that fingerprints cannot tell you anything about race or ethnicity. DNA can really tell you, well, can certainly tell you sex. We use that all the time. DNA, again, kind of like physical description, some of those markers that are used to establish physical description can also be used to tell you the race and ethnicity of, of somebody. Now, uh, another reason why um, I've put here the definition of a fingerprint, you see I've highlighted a mark. Technically, in the fingerprint world, a fingerprint is what you see here in this image. It is when you ink somebody's finger and you are making an exemplar or a known copy of their finger pattern. That is technically a fingerprint. In 
the crime scene world, if you were to recover a fingerprint, that would actually be called a mark, um, you know, in, in the kind of scientific world. We're going to see very quickly that forensic science very much, or it's not forensic science, fingerprinting very much is not science. And one of the kind of basis of science is that you use standardized terminology and the terminology in the fingerprint world is all over the place. You know, you have some people just talking about latents all the time, some people talking about latent prints, some people saying prints, some people saying marks. Really, really, this is a mark. You know, what you're finding is friction ridge detail that has been left behind on an object or at a crime scene. But we throw around the term fingerprint because it's kind of part of our colloquial language. Everyone kind of under, sort of understands what it means. But if you really want to get technical and in the letter, level of expertise, you would call it friction ridge detail or a mark. Part of that is because any part of your hand is useful for an identification, not just the fingertip. The fingertip is like the easy part. But you can make an identification from friction ridge detail from the palm, from the soles of your feet, basically anywhere where there's enough um, variation in that friction ridge detail that you have characteristic that you can do a comparison. So fingerprints are part of the larger field of pattern evidence. Pattern evidence is really any type of evidence where you're matching stuff. So sometimes it's called feature-based comparison evidence or just pattern evidence. So fingerprints, tool marks, uh, tire marks, footwear impressions, um, firearms evidence, anytime where you're quote unquote matching something um, is going to be pattern evidence. One of the massive problems with pattern evidence is again, this lack of standardization, which again, as we go through this um, presentation, you'll see this more and more, this kind of lack of standardized terminology, methodology, um, you know, the number of characteristics needed to declare that it's an identification, all the rest of it. And in other presentations, when I talk about science and forensic science, I have what I call the rainbow of forensic science. You know, what's the most sciencey forensic science? Well, that's gonna be DNA. That's why it's called the gold standard. And then as you go down that rainbow, you are traveling further and further away from that gold standard. And really those bottom layers of the rainbow are where we're gonna find all of our pattern evidence fields. So on that note of a lack of standardization, there are two, maybe three types of fingerprints depending on where you trained, who trained you, what country you work in. Now, I was very fortunate that most of my forensic training was in the United Kingdom. Um, fortunate in the sense that it is a very robust system of forensic science. Uh, and also fortunate because it's given me a different perspective of forensic science. Unfortunate because I had to come back to the United States <laughs> and I had to completely relearn everything that I thought I knew about forensic science and how forensic science worked. Um, so having been trained in fingerprints in the United Kingdom, they recognize two types of fingerprints. They're either visible or invisible. That's how they break it down. So a latent fingerprint is invisible. That is, a, that is friction ridge detail that is left behind by natural secretions. And the visible marks are gonna be plastic marks. They're left in anything that you can see, blood, grease, dirt, clay, whatever. Here in the United States, if you've been trained by the FBI, which most of our latent fingerprint examiners have been trained by somebody who at one time was trained by the FBI. It's kind of like whisper down the lane how a lot of fingerprint training happens. But under the FBI, they recognize three types of, of marks. They rep, everybody agrees on latents, left behind, you know, invisible, left behind by natural secretions. Here in the United States, we will say a patent. It is a patent fingerprint, like if something is patently true. Patent means obvious, you can see it. So again, sometimes you'll have examiners that'll say a patent fingerprint. No, it is a patent fingerprint. These are the ones that are left in something that you can see. Again, they're obvious. So blood, grease, dirt, whatever. And then here in the United States, um, we recognize plastic fingerprints as being three-dimensional fingerprints left in some kind of tacky substance like wet paint. Or in this case, this is one of the fingerprints from my research. Uh, this object is from Mesopotamia. It's 5,000 years old. And we've got a beautifully preserved bit of friction ridge detail um, from the person that smushed that clay together 5,000 years ago. And there is enough detail in those friction ridges that if I had something to compare it to, I could do a comparison. So up here we have our latent fingerprint that is um, dust with powder to make the invisible visible. Here we have our patent fingerprint left in blood, which you could examine in its current form, or you could treat it with a chemical that would react with certain components of the blood 
to maybe bring out some of these fainter areas that you can't see kind of in its current state. And then we've got our plastic fingerprint here that you can obviously see. I see there are some uh, questions here. So do fingerprints change as we age? The pattern itself does not change. It just kind of expands. The way that your pattern would change is if you cut yourself deeply enough to create a scar. And um, I don't know if I have any pictures of scars. I don't think I do in this presentation, but you can really identify where there's a scar. It's almost like looking at a fault line for an earthquake. You kind of see the shift in the lines and you can see where they used to connect, uh, but they're, they're slightly kind of off, off of each other. Um, another way that your fingerprints will change, they don't really change though, is you, uh, just like on your face, you develop wrinkles in your fingerprints. And once a wrinkle forms, and again, wrinkles, you can tell the difference between a, a scar and a wrinkle. A wrinkle just kind of looks like a white void. We'll see some examples in, in a little bit. Once that wrinkle forms, it does not move. It does not shift around. It does not disappear. So wrinkles can actually, just like scars, become identifying features. Wrinkles also become identifying features. So those are really the only changes. The actual structure of your ridges, the characteristics within your ridge do not change as you age. Um, in fact, the hardest people to fingerprint are little old ladies. They should be our master criminals because dishwashing really does a number on your fingerprints. You develop so many wrinkles that if you tried to fingerprint somebody, they would have, uh, it looks like a hash mark, just lots of little lines going up and down and across the way. You, it completely obscures any of the friction ridge detail. Um, let's see. Uh, how do we know that we've never seen two people with the same prints? Is that a comparison process that is tracked somehow? That's a really good question. So I guess one way that one example that you could give is, you know, let's look in the United Kingdom. They have the National Automated Fingerprint Identification System, NAFIS. Back when I was a graduate student, it held 200 million individual fingerprints. Now at this point, it probably is more than double that. And of all those millions of fingerprints, none of them are from, you know, none of them are the same, but from different people. So we have very large sample sizes where we have never found two different people with the same fingerprints. But the system in the United Kingdom doesn't talk to the system here in the United States. So we can't say that we have a totality of all the fingerprints ever collected to say that, you know, never, ever, ever have there ever been two people with the same fingerprints, just like we can't fingerprint anybody who's ever lived to really say that statement as well. But out of these very large data sets, we have never found two different people with the same fingerprint. Um, all right, that's all the questions at the moment. All right, so moving on. So fingerprint patterns. There are actually 30 different types of fingerprint patterns. And this comes down to something called the Henry classification system. One of the fun things about fingerprints is that the field as a whole really hasn't changed much since it was created in the early 1800s. I mean, it, it, it's, it's pretty stable. Um, and in the early 1800s, I'm not going to go too much into like all the founders of fingerprints and stuff like that. But this one guy, Edward Henry, is pretty important. He was the uh, commissioner of the Metropolitan Police in England, really loved his fingerprints, and he did a lot to really um, kind of institutionalize the process of using fingerprints for forensic purposes. And one of the things that he did, because they obviously didn't have computerized systems back then, is come up with this classification system to be able to organize all these fingerprint records to try to streamline the comparison process. And he was the one that basically defined what makes, what makes uh, all these kind of sub patterns, what they are, and how to create this classification system. Um, now that we have automated systems, very few, examiners under the age of like, I even wanna say 50, know anything about the classification system or use the Henry classification system. It's, it's kind of not necessary anymore. But if you talk to an examiner, I, I have one of my really good friends is a, a retired fingerprint examiner and he's well into his seventies now. And he's one of the few people that I know that knows anything about the Henry classification system. But, it's not, it, I mean, it's, it's a useful thing to know. I'm not gonna go into too much depth, but I'll kind of show you how there are the major patterns of arches, loops, and whirls, which pretty much everyone has heard of, what those sub, some, some of those subcategories are between them. Uh, the Henry classification system is, you know, for those that still know what it is and use it, is universal, it's used across kind of all, all countries, like one of the only standards in fingerprints. 
What makes a pattern a pattern is going to be the core, the center of the fingerprint, kind of what's going on in the very, very center. Do you have you know, something that looks like a hairpin? Do you have something that looks like a rod, et cetera? And then the number of deltas. So here's another question for you guys. What is you know, the, the Greek letter delta D? What is the shape of that? Like, how would you, how would you define delta in terms of what it looks like? Let me put that in the chat. It's a triangle, very good. And for those of you guys who remember your like high school math, what does delta stand for in mathematics? If you're gonna use it, change, very good. Um, so you'll see why these are called deltas in just a minute. All right, so our very first pattern out of arches, loops, and whirls is the arch. Um, what defines an arch? Oh, there's a question here. Is anyone else just staring at their fingerprints throughout this? Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, and you know, go home tonight. You know, if you just cleaned your like storm door or whatever, go stick those fingerprints all over it and have a look and have and see what patterns you have and all that kind of stuff. All right, so arches are the simplest, the most basic of all fingerprint patterns. What defines it is that the core is is kind of really a continuous line in the center of the print. Uh, the core is pretty central. And really what defines an arch is there is no delta. Now this will be clearer once we see some deltas um, to, to know what, what that means. Do you guys think uh, arches are common or rare? These very simple fingerprints, are they common or rare? All right, we've got a, we've got a real mix. They are the most rare, only 5% of all fingerprints. 5% are gonna be arches. So if any of you guys have arches, you are super special snowflakes. You are part of the 5%. Um, now, forensically, this is great. If you have an arch that, you know, kind of like back in the day before we had DNA and we were just using blood groups, you know, some of the blood groups are really rare. So if you had that blood group, you know, it didn't necessarily lead to an identification, but it certainly ruled out a whole bunch of people. So I'm always excited when I see arches in any of my work. Uh, can you have different? Yes, absolutely. We'll we'll get to um, to that in just a minute. But yes, you can have all the same pattern. You can have all different patterns. You can have a mixture. Um, the well, I'll just go ahead and I'll just you know clue you guys in. So the patterns are genetically based. If you look at your hands, you will notice that you have some nice kind of meaty pads on the tips of your fingers, and you have kind of this chunky meaty bit right here under your fingers and you've got a big pad here under your thumb and you've got a big pad here under your uh, little finger. These are called volar pads. These are just like the pads that you see on your cat or dog. Um, and they help us to grip onto things. They all have names if you study anatomy and stuff like that. And you know, some people who are really into fingerprints do all that, that sort of thing. All these creases have names, everything. Um, and these volar pads form six weeks after conception. So really, really early on. And if you see like a picture of a fetal hand, it does look like a little paw. You don't have fingers, you have finger buds and you can very clearly see defined those kind of like pads on a fetal hand. After they form, then your actual ridges start to form on the skin. And the only reason why we know all this, because obviously we're not watching this happen, is we just know this from, you know, fetuses that have been stillborn and just kind of absor absor um, observing what we find at the different stages of gestation. So around about eight to 12 weeks, friction ridges start to form and they kind of flow across the skin as they form. Now, the theory is, again, we can't really test this experimentally, but the theory is, is that as your friction ridges flow across the skin, they encounter these pads and they take the path of least resistance. So they flow over them, they flow around them, whatever. And the size and the shape of your pad is going to dictate what pattern you end up with. So if you have just kind of a tiny little, you know, you're not very meaty, you've got a little tiny pad in the middle of your finger, those ridges are just gonna flow up and over that volar pad and you're gonna have an arch. Uh, let's, I'll just quickly go to this next one. If you have a volar pad that's kind of off to the side, the ridges kind of bounce off of it and form a loop. And then if you have kind of the big fat meaty finger, the ridges don't really know what to do and so they go around and you have a whirl. That's our theory. Um, again. As far as I'm aware, nobody has done any sort of like measurements or statistics or anything like that. 
but that's the best that we've got when it comes to fingerprints as to why we have these patterns. And we do see some sort of genetic basis. You will have similar patterns to your parents, your kids will have similar patterns to you. I mean, my son, his fingerprints are almost indistinguishable to my fingerprints. They are definitely different, but if you just look at the patterns and where they're placed on each finger, you would think you were looking at the same person. So there does seem to be a genetic com component as to whether, uh, as to what patterns you have on each finger. Uh, so in terms of now those subcategories, we have three types of arches uh, that pretty much everybody, well, I was gonna say everybody agrees on. Everybody agrees on this, the plain arch, the really super basic one. Everyone agrees on this one in the bottom left-hand corner, the tented arch, which kind of has like that tent shape in the middle. These other two here are what I was trained to call an approximating arch. An approximating arch almost looks like a loop, but it is not a true loop. It is actually an arch. Now, I'm not entirely sure that this is one that fits under the FBI categories, but the FBI has a lot, far fewer subcategories than other places that do fingerprints. All right, loops, what defines a loop? A loop has to have the core, the center of the print, slightly off to one side. And um, I mean, the cores can do various different things. This one, uh, we have what would be called a trifurcation. We basically have three connected rods in the middle. Sometimes you can just have a singular rod. Sometimes you can have like a hairpin, but those sorts of features inside the core is what defines it as a loop. And then most importantly, we have one delta. So if you look here in the fingerprint, you will see this triangular feature. And it also represents one change. Our ridges are entering the fingerprint, they are changing direction, and then they are exiting the same side from which they entered. So if we go back to the arch, there is no triangular structure, so there is no delta. And we have no change. We don't, we call it recurve. We don't have any ridges that fully recurve. The ridges enter and they exit the opposite side. So going back to our approximating arch, um, in either of these, we do not have a true uh, triangular structure. This one is maybe close to it, but we don't have any recurve. So you might say, okay, well that's triangle, but none of the ridges actually recurve on themselves. They enter and then they exit the opposite side. This one, we don't have a true recurve and we don't have the three sides of a triangle. So they would technically be classified as arches, but the type of arch would be called an approximating arch. So the name of the loop depends on which way it's looping. So can anyone tell me which bone extends from your thumb? Which bone is there? You can put it in the chat. Some of you guys know, you do sports and stuff. We'll see if it appears in the chat and then I'll answer the questions in just a minute. Anybody know which bone extends from the thumb or which bone extends from the, oh yeah, yeah, good job, Adam. The radius extends from your thumb. So then what extends from the little finger? The ulna, very, very good. So this is where our loops get their name. If I made this impression that you see in front of you with my right hand, the tail, the like liney parts of that loop are pointing to my little finger. So that would make it an ulnar loop. If I make it with my left hand, that tail is pointing to my thumb. Now it's a radial loop. So it's really important to know which hand made the mark to know whether you've got a radial loop or an ulnar loop. Um, and I should have looked it up before I had this presentation, but I can't remember off the top of my head. One of them, I can't remember if it's radial or ulnar, is vastly more common than the other. Um, you can easily find it. But so that's also important as well. Um, when you kind of get trained in fingerprints, you learn that some patterns are more common on certain fingers. Uh, like for instance, uh, whirls are like really super common on your thumb. And there's a particular type of whirl called an accidental that suits, you know, really only appears on thumbs. Um, so sometimes depending on the pattern, it can give you a good guess as to what finger actually left that mark. And again, as you work more with fingerprints, a lot of the angles of some of the the spaces here between these lines can tell you if it's the right hand versus the left hand and so forth. Um, Adam has six owner loops. Oh yeah, I forgot to ask. Loops, common or rare? 
common or rare? What do you guys think? Yes, loops are the most common. 70% of all fingerprints are gonna be loops, which really, when I see a loop for evidence, uh, it's like, oh, this is, this is awful because this isn't helping me at all. Uh, very, very common. There's a question here I want to ask. Um, <laughs> all right, okay, I think I went through all the questions. There is a super rare loop I mean, I've seen a lot of fingerprints in my day, and I think I've only ever seen two of these. It is called a Newton's loop, or sometimes it's called a lazy loop or a droopy loop. Uh, this is a loop that instead of being very kind of perky and pointing up to the sky, kind of flops over the delta. It's kind of a loop that like didn't have the, its caffeine yet. And uh, again, very, very uh, rare. I've seen very few of them, but they, they are out there. Whirls. So whirls are kind of the fingerprints gone a bit crazy. All kinds of things can happen in a whirl. Uh, they are make up about 25% of all fingerprints. Um, so with a whirl, the core can be anywhere, left, right, center, whatever. It can do all kinds of things. I've seen lots of pictures on social media where there's like a little heart in the center or there's, you know, features that look like a little smiley face, like all kinds of fun things happen in whirls. The important thing is that there are at least two deltas. That is really what defines a world. You can see here on all of our images, we've got a delta here on either side. So a plain world is our nice, nice circle with a delta on either side. Our other really common type of world, it's what's called a double loop. So we've got, again, a delta on either side that makes it a world. Um, I just put here just to be technical that a world is composed of two super incumbent loops, two loops on top of each other. So with our nice circle, you basically have one loop going up and one loop going down. Our double loop is very obvious that we've got two loops on top of each other. Uh, but we also have two changes in direction. We've got a 360. So we've got one change in direction right here and then going around another change in di direction. And actually while I'm thinking about it, let me put my laser pointer on so you guys can see this a little bit better. So one change of direction here and one change of direction there. We've got at least four different types of whirls, but again, depending on where you trained and who you trained others, there, there are lots of different names for these different, uh, these different whirls. And you know, it doesn't always necessarily matter. The important thing is that it's a whirl. So we've got our plain whirl, sometimes known as an elliptical whirl. We've got a double loop, sometimes known as a twin loop. We've got a central pocket, uh, which in this case, we've got one delta kind of located centrally and then the other um, delta located kind of in its normal space. A lateral pocket is very similar. It's just like the deltas are shifted. So you've got one delta that's kind of in the center, but towards the bottom, and then another delta that's kind of off to the side. But when you have this kind of teardrop shape, that tends to be your central uh, pocket. And then we've got the accidental. The accidental is just that, it's an accident. It's not a true arch loop or whirl, but it's just put in the whirl category. And then a composite is where you have uh, more than two loops. You might have three loops. You know, this is where you start getting three deltas, four deltas. You know, the buddy, the guy that trained me said that the most that's ever been recorded is seven deltas. I mean, I would love to see that fingerprint. I can't even imagine. Uh, but typically with composites, there's like three deltas. You have your twins loop and then you have this other like loop on the side. Also very rare, usually only appears on phones. But lots of people have arches, loops, and whirls. All of you guys have been looking at your arches, loops, and whirls. Somebody said that they had six loops. They were very loopy. So how do we tell the difference between one loop versus another loop? And this comes down to what is usually known as minutia. Sometimes it's called points of comparison. Sometimes it's called ridge details. Sometimes it's called ridge variation. Again, this lack of standardization of terminology. But you know, for the most part, people call it minutia. So here is my right thumb. You can see here my wrinkles. Um, and you know these three points, every time I leave a mark, they are like the first thing that anybody ever sees. They're actually really good for, um, for comparison. So right now we have the whole fingerprint together. We've been looking at what we call level one detail. That's where you can see all the ridges together and the overall pattern that they make. But can you make an identification with level one detail if it's an archer, liberal world? No, we've obviously just said that. What can you do though? 
if all you have is an arch, a loop, or a whirl. You can make an identification, but what could you do with that? You guys can put that in the chat. What could you do with just an arch, a loop, or a whirl? Yes, very good. You can exclude. Uh, yeah, you can narrow down your suspects. Um, and you can also, you know, um, narrow down where on somebody's hands. Like if you just have one mark, you, you know, here's the suspect and they have, you know, one whirl and the world that you're comparing, com the mark you're comparing to is a whirl. Well, then you aren't going to look at any of his arches or his loops. You're going to look at the whirls that are on his hand. So yeah, it's good for narrowing down, good for exclusion. What really makes the fingerprint unique is what's going on inside. So the individual ridge path. So if I pick a ridge here and I follow it along, we see at this point, it splits into two and directly underneath of it, a ridge comes to an end. And we have another ridge that has split into two and so on and so forth. You know, the more you look at the detail within the friction ridges, you'll see all these little features. You see this little guy hanging out by themselves. You see this kind of sort of like donut looking structure and those are your minutia. And that is what makes your fingerprint quote unquote unique. So our rich variations are minutiae. Again, really depends on who trained you, no standard terminology. The things that we can all agree on are ridge endings where ridge just comes to an end and a bifurcation where ridge splits into two, it furcates. These other ones are just combinations of ridge endings and bifurcations, but they have different names depending on who you're talking to. So a lake, sometimes it's called an island. It's just two bifurcations, it's like your donut structure. A spur, I think all of them call them spurs. Uh, short independent, sometimes they're called dots. A crossover, sometimes they're called bridges. But again, it's just two bifurcations. This is just two ridge endings. So for all those automated um, uh, databases and software, they're looking at ridge endings and bifurcations. That's what they're gonna mark up when they, when they um, are um, trying to do a comparison um, in, a, in a digital format. So here, oh, let me just go. So this is what um, you know. Traditionally, a fingerprint examiner is going to do is they're going to place some you know some kind of mark over where they see all the different features, and they're going to number those. And the corresponding number between your known and your unknown should agree with each other. So if number four is a bifurcation on my known fingerprint for my suspect. Number four on the dusted latent that was collected at the crime scene should also be a bifurcation. And I'll get a little bit more into the examination in just a minute. Actually, in the very next slide. So many of you guys have heard of ACEV. And, you know, ACEV is kind of fun. Analysis, comparison, evaluation, verification. ACEV is not a methodology. <laughs> it is not a methodology. It is a workflow or it is like, you know, a little helpful reminder of what you're supposed to do next. It is not a methodology because ACEV does not capture all the decisions that the examiner makes within each of those sections. And we'll, we'll see more of that in just a minute. First of all, why do we examine fingerprints? What did I say in one of the earlier slides? Well, fingerprints are the ultimate form of identification, but there are also lots of great reasons to examine fingerprints. We leave them around all over the place. You know, they are, they are prolific. We know that fingerprints don't change over time in terms of, you know, the pattern, being able to link a pattern back to an individual. We know that fingerprints last on evidence for a pretty good amount of time under certain circumstances. Fingerprints are cheap. It takes like a few bucks to dust them and lift them. It takes really very little time to do an examination, you know, particularly if you have a one-to-one -one examination. Here is the potential owner, and here is the question, the unknown mark. It really doesn't take very long to put them side by side and decide whether they agree or not. So it's fast, it's cheap. It doesn't require a whole lot of training for better or for worse, which is why here in the United States, a lot of our police officers do fingerprinting. I mean, I could, I have some views on that for sure, but you know, it's, it is an art. It is not a science. Um, but there's lots, of, yeah. And another, I mean, another great thing about fingerprinting is you get better at it the more you do it. It is very much one of those fields uh, that, you know, the more you practice, the more, you know, the, just the better you are. It's just, you know, it, so 
for my students, it gives them hope <laughs> that if they're really crappy at it now, just stick to it, you will improve. So again, ACE-B, when doing our examination, this is what we should be following. Many, many forces do not follow it, particularly the V in ACE-B. I'll talk about that more in a minute. So the analysis, the analysis captures so much work, which is why this is not a methodology, because a methodology would outline every single step the examiner did throughout the whole of the examination. So the first part of the analysis, what is your fingerprint left in and what is your fingerprint left on? So the matrix is what your fingerprint is left in. If it's a latent fingerprint, what is the matrix? So you guys can put it in, the, if it's a latent fingerprint, what would the matrix be? No, no, the fingerprint's what your, the matrix is what your fingerprint is left in. So if it's a latent fingerprint, what is the fingerprint left in? Secretions, very good, sweat. Your natural secre secretions. Um, the substrate is what your fingerprint is left on. So glass, paper, fabric, banknotes, whatever. And what's really important in terms of what you decide to do next, well, both of them are important. You know, if you have blood versus you have a secretion, that's gonna dictate kind of your work, you know, what direction you're gonna go. But if your substrate is a porous substrate and it is, it is absorbent, then you're probably not gonna wanna use a powder because it's absorbent because it has a lot of little holes and gaps in it and powders are not gonna be very helpful. If your substrate is non-absorbent like glass or plastic, most chemical developers are not gonna be particularly useful to you. So one of the really important things in fingerprint training is knowing what chemical or powder or you know, what kind of development method is appropriate for your matrix, what your fingerprint is left in, and your substrate, what your fingerprint is left on. Now in the United Kingdom, they have this like fingerprint Bible and it is just pages and pages of um, flow charts. If this, then that and it guides the examiner through what the examiner has and therefore how the examiner should treat it. We have nothing like that here in the United States. Um, most examiners get trained in one or two techniques, ninhydrin, most people are, are trained in ninhydrin, super glue fuming, those are, you know, those are pretty common and they feel comfortable with that. And then they pretty much just employ that across the board. They don't necessarily know why, always, why they use those particular techniques. And they certainly don't know alternative techniques that probably would have produced better results. So that's one of my kind of like soapbox issues about how it's mostly law enforcement that is fingerprinting in the United States. In the United Kingdom, it's usually people with chemistry degrees because you know if you don't produce good evidence to start with, you're not gonna have a good comparison down the line. Um, so as I mentioned, there's lots of methods for lifting and developing. We think of the powders. There are lots of different types of powders, different colors of powders. Some powders fluoresce, which are really useful if you had a highly patterned background. Uh, we have magnetic powders, which are pretty much the only powder that you could use on a pore surface. But again, it's a huge judgment call by the examiner that they are going to select this particular development method over, you know, lots of them, lots of them. Uh, once they have visualized the fingerprint, they've developed it in some way so they can see it and, and get good detail, then they've got to figure out how are they going to get that pattern off of their objects. Are they just going to take a picture of it? Um, are they going to, um, I'll answer that question in just a minute. Are they going to take, take a picture of it? Are they going to actually physically lift it off? And again, lots of methods for lifting. You can just use special lifting tape. You can use something called microsil, which is kind of like a gel that you spread over top and it hardens into like a rubbery silicon and you peel the fingerprint off. Uh, we have other types of lifters. There's all, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I like fingerprints. There's all these different fun things to choose from, but you are making a judgment call and you might choose the wrong thing. Uh, and then finally, same thing with chemicals as well. There are chemicals that will destroy DNA. So another judgment call is a lot of times the examiner has to choose, is this piece of evidence gonna be better for the pattern or is this piece of evidence gonna be better for the DNA? Like if it's a bloody fingerprint, do I have enough detail that I should develop the blood and potentially you know, degrade the DNA because the pattern is so good? 
or should I just take a swab and just eradicate the pattern because having the blood is the better option? Once you have your finger, so again, this is why A is not a methodology. The methodology are all these other sub things that I just listed, all these different steps in the process. After you have captured your mark and you've got something that you, can, that you think you can work with, the next thing that you do is you make a determination, value versus no value. A value mark is something you can do something with. You can see level one detail. You can see it's an archer looper world. You can see uh, bifurcations and ridge endings. You can make a comparison with it. That is a mark of value. A mark of no value is you just, you can't do anything with this. And, um, you know, the Brandon Mayfield case, which is the big fingerprint case that like, it's really, really awful. Uh, I'll talk about it maybe a little bit more in, in a minute. I mean, that mark, in my opinion, was of no value. I would never in a million years even attempt to make a comparison. And we'll talk about more about what they did later. Why is it so difficult for the US to adopt similar standards to the UK? Well, first of all, nobody in the US ever wants to hear how they do it elsewhere. <laughs> I mean, I see the eye rolls when I talk to my law enforcement friends and I'm like, in the UK, you know, they're like, oh God, I'm so sick of hearing this. Um, it's more the question of why it's, is it so easy in the UK? It's so easy in the UK because it's a small country and it's really easy for everybody to sing off the same song sheet. You know, everything is kind of standardized. Here, we've got every single county doing things differently within a state. We've got every state doing things differently. We've got state agencies doing things differently from federal agencies. So we're just super fractured across our entire forensic spectrum. And being on the OSAC, I talk to law enforcement colleagues every single day that have never heard of OSAC. And our whole job is supposed to make law enforcement follow these standards. They don't even know we exist in the first place. So there's just so many ways, there's so many opportunities for communication breakdown. Um, and I think if we could at least get our act together in a single state, like if maybe a small state could kind of operate in a similar way that the United Kingdom operates, maybe that might set a model for more standardization across the board. But we'd have to get We'd have to start with like a single state kind of behaving properly. All right, so our levels of detail, we decide we have a fingerprint of value. So then we would say, okay, what level of detail do I have? Level one detail, you can tell it's an archer looper world. You can't do an identification, but you can do an exclusion. Level two detail, you can see bifurcations and ridge endings, you've got minutia. That is what you need. That is like the baseline for doing an identification. Level three detail, these are really fine details. So if you look at a fingerprint under a microscope, those ridges are not smooth. They are lumpy and bumpy. Um, inside the ridge, which we can see in this next image here, you might be able to see in the um, rolled fingerprint, this is our exemplar, you might be able to see inside some of the ridges, you might see little white dots. Those are sweat pores. Every ridge is made up of a series of sweat pores. We call them ridge units. It's just a block of skin with a sweat pore. It's how our skin breathes. And if you get a really clear fingerprint, you can actually see the pores. The pores have a pattern in and of themselves. So that level three detail is a combination of the pattern of the pores and the actual features on the edges of the ridge. You know, those of you guys who know your forensic science, you know Edmund Lacard. He was super interested in what he called ridgeology and poroscopy basically just looking at these really tiny features. We have very little academic research to show their statistical significance in terms of uniqueness, but they are sometimes used as a form of identification. This is where the Brandon Mayfield case became such a problem because there were no minutia in those marks. There was no level two detail. There was maybe some level one detail, it looks pretty much like an arch, so the whole basis of the comparison was on level three kind of ridge dimensional attributes. And yeah, they got it wrong, which caused all kinds of problems. And we are where we are today in forensic science because of it. All right, so this entire slide is the A of ACE V. <laughs> this entire slide is basically the C, E, and V, right? So the comparison is you have your known mark that is taken from a known individual, you know this loop belongs to Mr. Jones, and then you have your questioned mark or your unknown mark, and that's what comes from your evidence. You don't know the owner of it. And the comparison is just comparing the known with the unknown. 
do they agree or do they not? And the terminology that we use or that we should be using, not everybody's there yet, the terminology is a source conclusion. Can you conclude that Mr. Jones and the unknown are of the same source? That's what we say instead of matching. We don't say consistent with, we don't say, yeah, we say they're a, a source identification or they're the same source. And a lot of the forensic fields are moving towards this language of source identification and also um, uh, likelihood ratios, which I'll maybe talk about maybe if we have time. I saw some questions here. In a perfect world, who should be lifting prints from scenes? There seems to be a lot of things to take into consideration. Yeah, in a perfect world, a latent print examiner should be lifting the prints from the scene because they're the ones that are actually trained. I mean, if you have someone who's actually trained, they're the ones that are actually trained in how to best handle the, the <coughs> fingerprints. So again, I'll you know, keep on referring back to the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, the crime scene examiners will collect the item but they will leave it to the laboratory to dust or develop the fingerprint. Even if that means taking a whole door off of its hinges, they'll do that rather than try to process it at the scene. Uh, as someone who has lifted prints in one medium or another, a lot of what you brought up was not included in our trainings to collect prints evidence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> There are some courses that really are super thorough. Uh, there is a, a company called Ron Smith's Associates that does a five month fingerprinting training program. I have not personally taken it, but I would imagine in five months, you would get a really good idea of all these different considerations and how to handle them and all the different processes and techniques. But a lot of examiners are trained in you know 40 weeks or maybe a hundred hours, or for, sorry, 40, 40 hours, maybe a hundred hours. And a lot of the focus is more on the comparison and not so much on the actual acquisition. And again, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't get yourself a good mark to start with, you've got nothing to compare. All right, so um, we'll just kind of look through the comparison here. So we've got our, uh, we've got letter I. Letter I is a bifurcation in our known print. We go across to our unknown. Letter I is also a bifurcation. G is a ridge ending. G is also a ridge ending. And then here comes the counting. One, two, three, four, five ridges away is F. One, two, three, four, five ridges away is F. So it's gotta be the same point in the same place in the same relationship to the other points, there's a lot of ridge counting in fingerprint comparison, and you cannot have anything in disagreement. That is how, it, so you can't have a bifurcation in one that doesn't seem to appear in the other. Again, there are a lot of judgment calls because you know th this is a very nice uh, fingerprint that's come from our, our latent uh, our latent fingerprint from rear, rear view mirror, but you can see it's kind of grainy. And in some lifted prints, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell whether that ridge ending is really a ridge ending or is it just the sweat pore getting in the way and we didn't get enough adherence from the powder to actually show that it's connected. Um, or maybe we're just missing data. You know, We don't have uh, any of the ridges that develops, but you can kind of see how this ridge should you know, continue on to this other fragment that you have here over here. So again, a lot, you know, we're dealing with incomplete information when we have an unknown, we have a lifted latent. And so sometimes we have to fill in some of those blanks. And we're gonna talk about cognitive bias in a little bit, which is one of the problems with filling in the blanks. So the comparison is just this, a side-by-side -side comparison. You can do it with images on your computer screen. You can have an automated system do it. I'll talk more about the automated systems in just a minute but it, it is literally this, you know, spot the difference. Where do you see the same bifurcation? Do you see things that disagree? The evaluation is just, what do you think? Is this a source conclusion? Is this a, a source identification or not? So the E is literally just, what is your opinion? <laughs> you know, A had all these steps. E is just, what do you think it is? Again, why this is not a methodology. And then the verification is getting another examiner to redo the comparison and ideally agree with your, with your E, with your evaluation. Now, there are a whole can of worms of issues here because a lot of times there is no evaluation or no verification. 
or the verification is done by somebody who already knows what the answer is. Like, was there, okay, I've got, you know, I've got an identification. Can you just have a look at this? Well, they already know what the conclusion is, right? So very, very rarely are the verifications blind, purely blind, which again is essential in science, right? You know, black box studies, um, blinded tests, all the rest of it. And we don't usually do that. I do verifications for one of our local prosecutor's offices. They send me a known and an unknown. I tell them to cover over any information. I don't want to see anything on the fingerprint form. I don't want to know anything about the case. But even then, it's not truly blind because I know that if they're sending me these two marks, it's because they think that it's an identification. So it's never, you know, what they should do is they should send me three or four knowns and then the mark from the crime scene, and then it truly becomes blind. But we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> So that's ACEV is um, making sure that you verify your, um, your final, final answer. All right, so back in the old days, all of the known marks were taken by 10 print forms. So rolled impressions for your right hand, your left hand, and then plain impressions. Plain impressions are where you roll upwards to get the tips of the fingers. And they would be filed away using the Henry classification system so that when you found your unknown, you didn't have to sort through all these documents. You could go to the section that you know fits with the classification that you gave your unknown. And uh, you would do a visual side-by-side -side inspection using magnification, kind of hunched over. It wasn't very fun at all. Now we've got technology. So, APHIS, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, it was developed by the FBI in 1977, I think was the very first APHIS system. Um, we now have multiple companies that produce various forms of APHIS, uh, Morpho, Sagem, NEC, Cogent, all these different companies, they merge from time to time. And they, uh, I think AWARE is a new one that used to be AFIX Tracker. Um, they all have their own kind of proprietary way of storing the fingerprints, doing the comparisons, all the rest of it. And different agencies use different softwares depending on who they have contracts with or they heard good things about this company so they decide to use this company or whatever. So again, a lack of consistency across the board in terms of just the, the storage and the automated quote unquote matching of fingerprints. Um, that still requires a large amount of human input. We really, you know, all these companies, they do not really recommend to have the software find all the minutia because the software can only see so much. We'll see a picture in just a minute. Really the recommendation is that your examiner goes in, marks up the minutia on your unknown and then runs a search against the database. The database will bring up a series of matches and it will give them a score based on whatever algorithm that particular type of software uses. And then it's still the examiner that goes through the potential matches and does the side by side to make the decision. It's really this, the, the thing that is automated is like the filing system, the, the actual comparison, evaluation, that still is not really automated. That still it really is down to the examiner. Um, IAFIS, the Integrated Automated Identification System, which is run federally, is really not uh, integrated. That was always the goal, was to get all the AFIS systems talking together. But basically, the FBI system still stands alone and separate from all the little local agencies. So each local agency will have their own AFIS system. The state will have an AFIS system. And they really do not talk to each other. Again, this is in contrast to other countries where there is a national system and everybody's inputting their latents into a singular system. So that's, so that's, our, that's our APHIS. I can talk more about APHIS later if people have questions about that. The other kind of change in technology is live scan. So some agencies are still use inked forms and then they scan the forms into their APHIS system. But more and more agencies are investing in live scan where it's like at the airport where they just scan the fingerprints on a little glass plate and it goes directly into the system. I haven't yet found too many agencies where their APHIS and their live scan are connected, where they can run a search right on the spot. 
that is the ideal. And again, in other countries, that is what they do. So you could be, you could be arrested on like drunken disorderly behavior, your fingerprints are taken and it might hit to evidence that's been sitting in the system from cases from 20 years ago. Uh, but we don't, we don't do that here. So here's an example um, of, a, of an APHIS system. And you know the pretty print, that's gonna be your known mark. That's gonna be taken from a, a, a 10 print form. It looks like this is a plain impression because I can see you know, the next finger next to it. And this grainy, ugly thing is the um, lifted print, lifted latent from the crime scene. And the examiner should be the one uh, putting in these little lollipops. And these lo little lollipops indicate um, whether it's a bifurcation or a ridge ending. The system that I use, AFIX Tracker, it has something called auto extract, where the system will place the lollipops and then you can move them around or change them or add ones or take them away. And, you know, I use them a lot for my ancient fingerprints. And I can tell you, the system does not find all the minutia and the system finds minutia that isn't there. So we still find that humans are better at this than the technology. So it is not really so automated. All right, you guys looking at this side by side, well, you know, we don't say match, but just for the purposes of typing into chat, do you think that this is a match or a no match? Tell me what you think. Match or no match? All right, Stacy says no match. What else do other people think? All right, we got a lot of no matches. This is this is a match. This is a source identification. What might be throwing you guys off is in our pretty print, the center, the core of the print is right there in the middle. The one on the right, our latent, you're only seeing the side of the person's finger. So here is the center of the prints. So you got all this data that would be right here missing. But if you count the little green lines where they're in agreement, there's 16. So that really is considered, you know, more than enough to say that this is a source identification. Um, yeah, it is definitely a match. You'll see here kind of at the bottom, um, you've got, uh, it's a little bit blurry, but it says match score. That is what the system is telling you. It thinks the strength of the match is based on whatever algorithm, proprietary algorithm that uses. Um, but we have found in casework that often the highest match score is not the actual ident. It's actually maybe the second or the third one that's in the list. So again, humans are still better than machines. What level of quality is needed for a print to be entered into APHIS? Oh, yeah, that's a whole nother kettle of fish. That is very agency dependent. Um, I know there's been, I'm in New Jersey, I know there's been a lot of strife in New Jersey uh, where local agencies will develop and lift you know, nice looking fingerprints, fingerprints that you could certainly do something with. But the, the manager of the state APHIS says, oh no, these are not good enough quality and they're not entered into APHIS. Uh, so it really depends on um, whoever is managing APHIS, whatever their standards are. But, you know, this is a, this is a pretty ugly fingerprint and it's still, it's still, you know, in my mind, perfectly acceptable. I mean, I, you know, I would still, I would still do a manual comparison. I would always trust a manual comparison over an automated, you know, automated or a did, you know, this kind of one. I would still, um, I would just it, enlarge the fingerprint and put them side by side in like a Word document. That's really all you need to do. Like I said, I think, you know, APHIS is really a, a filing system. If you have hundreds of marks and you just want to like narrow them down, most of our casework, we don't have an unknown just all by itself. We usually have some kind of suspect. We have some person that we think it belongs to. So most of our comparisons are a side-by-side -side comparison, which has problems definitely, which we'll talk about. All right, so some of our terminology, uh, like I said, we don't say match. It's a forensic source conclusion. We talk about knowns and unknowns. Um, we have kind of levels. This, this is trying to get to what is known as a probability score, a p-score. We're trying to get into the likelihood ratio thing that they're doing now in DNA. You can't, it's hard to do because you can't put numbers to fingerprints, right? But this, this is where we are right now. So a source exclusion is basically a no match. We can exclude this individual 
from being the source of this unknown print. But then it starts to get a little murky. So we think it's mostly an exclusion, but we can't say it's a slam dunk. Then we would say support for different sources. So it's kind of watered down a little bit. Like the probability is that this is a no match, but we're not like super certain. Then we have inconclusive. We don't know what it is. And I'd say generally, now this is totally anecdotally, I think generally the guidance is because of a lot of, lots of embarrassments that have happened in, in recent years that latent print examiners are being encouraged more to say inconclusive rather than say something. There's a long history of like, we wanna have an answer. Inconclusive isn't good enough. Um, but I think there's been enough embarrassment in this field that we're seeing certainly in the, in the newer generation entering it that they're definitely more inclined to say inconclusive, sometimes as a way of just playing it safe. Like they just, you know, they just don't feel comfortable. They'll just go say inconclusive. I'll answer that question in just a minute. Uh, so now we're getting into, okay, maybe, maybe I think it is a match. So support for a common source. Again, this is where it is not a slam dunk, but it's looking like the chances are more likely that it is this person than it's not this person. I'll give you an example. I've had a couple of verifications from this prosecutor's office where I've got, you know, four fingers. We'll say it's a, an arch, a loop, a whirl, an arch. Our suspect is an arch, a loop, a whirl, an arch. And on two or three of the fingers, I've got four minutia that agree, but there's not enough data. There's too much obscuring. I can't see enough of the ridges to find any more than four minutia. So all the level one detail agree. I've got, I've got some level two detail on multiple fingers that agree but I've only got four minutia on like finger one and maybe three on finger two, I would feel comfortable having like eight or 10. So I'm not gonna say it's a source conclusion. I wouldn't say it's a source conclusion because I don't feel like it's that slam dunk, but all signs are pointing to yes, really. Uh, and so that's when I would say support for a common source. That would be the, and I've, had, I've given that conclusion back a couple of times over. All right, so let me go to the uh, question here. Oh, I'm sorry that I'm going over time. I, I'll, I'll, I'm, uh, oh yeah, I still got a lot of slides. I'll try, I'll try to uh, be a little bit faster. Uh, let's see, let me make sure that. Uh, given everything discussed, how do the inconsistencies and lack of standardization in the US measure up to the amount of wrongful, wrongful convictions? Well, yeah, I think there's, I think you can draw a direct line between the two, um, mainly around the, ideas of, you know, the lack of the verification of um, the lack of standardization of training. I mean, I think that's really where it comes in. Like it doesn't, does it matter whether you call it a lake versus a dot? I don't really think so. But does it matter whether you, you know, are trained to use lots of different methods of, of uh, development versus one or two? Yeah, I think that matters. How do we start to enact standardization? Uh, you guys, <laughs> we've got to have the lawyers questioning the evidence and we've got to have wrongful convictions overturned. It's only through public embarrassment in the court system that we get any kind of change. Yeah, the UK has essentially always used one system. I mean, fingerprints started in the UK. Um, okay. All right, so let me, let me try to speed it up a little bit because we're, we're now getting into the juicier stuff. All right, so the problem with fingerprints, the training. There are no university level training programs. One of the big uh, recommendations in the National Academy uh, of Sciences 2009 report is to have that academic backbone. You know, is this stuff taught in universities? Yeah, I teach like a couple of classes on it, but you cannot get a degree in fingerprinting. You are reliant on some sort of company that you're gonna pay money to to train you on fingerprints or going to the FBI um, or just be trained in house. So many agencies, you know, it's this apprentice-like structure where you're trained by this old guy with gray hair. But if he's been doing it wrong for 35 years, guess what? He's gonna train the next generation to do it incorrectly. So again, kind of this whisper down the lane stuff. And, and I've been subject to that as well. You know, my training in the United Kingdom, um, some of the some of the words that I was trained to say, I don't know if maybe I misunderstood the 
accent or, but I, re I realized after I started doing my own research that some of the things I was taught about, like the structure of the skin and stuff like that was not, not entirely correct. And I had like gone and taught other people. So I had taught them incorrect stuff. Standards. Um, we have some groups that whose job is to create best practice and standards. So SWIGFAST was the original scientific working group devoted to fingerprints and they produced some documents and I believe their website still exists out there and you can find them. But then the OSACs were created in 2013. And so a lot of that work was kind of migrated over to the OSACs. They've done a lot of good work. Um, the work that they do gets published through the ASB, the Academy Standards Board. So you can find all these documents online. Uh, again, OSAC, go to the OSAC registry and you can see all of the, the documents related to friction ridge detail, friction ridge evidence. Um, but a lot of it is like, there is now a document of standard terminology. Does that actually, is that really a standard? Like, does that really tell you how to do the thing? It's a step in the right direction. And a lot of the standards are very kind of like the bare minimum, like some of the standards for crime scene examination. We tell you to measure stuff. Like it's really like, you know, the low bar. Um, so does that actually lead to a good job? Well, it just means that you're not doing the worst job, but um, yeah. So there's some criticism of standards as well. The International Association of Identification, the IAI, will certify you as a latent print examiner. There are some issues with this. I mean, basically you have to have like two years experience in a 40 hour course to be certified. Um, and you know, maybe a few other things, but like, it, again, it doesn't necessarily guarantee quality. It's more just jumping through a few hoops and taking a test and now you're certified. It doesn't really test your quality of work as an examiner. Uh, there's no international accreditation. So those of you guys who are familiar with like ISO 17025 that accredits forensic labs and stuff like that, there's no similar kind of accreditation mechanism for a latent print unit. Oftentimes they will fall under uh, the accreditation of other units, but it really is not very specific. And again, it's, it's minimal expectations, you know, have a filing system, like really basic stuff like that. It doesn't necessarily guarantee quality work. Um, the research and the peer review within the, and well, peer review of the research is improving in fingerprints. Um, so we are making progress. You know, fingerprints were one of the first areas that were slammed after the NAS report, after Daubert. Um, and so they've really had to get their act together a lot faster than maybe some of the other pattern fields. There's a lot of work still to do, but they've made serious strides. Um, competency testing is still not standard practice. So most latent print examiners do not undergo any kind of uh, annual competency testing or, you know, the Houston Forensic Science Center, which is like everybody's favorite lab, they will put fake casework into the normal like, you know, work pool, but not tell anybody. It's basically blind competency testing. Um, that does not happen in fingerprint units. Our error rates for fingerprinting, how often do we get it wrong? We still really, I mean, we're getting a better grasp on it, but we're, it's still not conclusive, like fingerprints are 85% accurate or whatever. We, we don't, we're not there yet. The field is largely practiced by non-scientists. So, you know, questioning a latent print examiner, if you just start scratching the surface of the science, you'll find real quick that they can't answer a lot of your questions. And again, as I said before, it is an art, not a science. So this was the Brandon Mayfield case. This was the fingerprint here of Brandon Mayfield uh, B. This was the mark that was recovered from the scene. Again, I would say this is no value. Uh, sort of looks like an arch. Maybe there's like a ridge ending there, maybe a little bit of a feature here, but largely it was based on, you know, the shape of the ridges. I mean, we don't have any pores that we can see, but those, those like ridge dimensional attributes. So that case is really directly what led to the NAS report of 2009. And hopefully you guys are all familiar with that, but basically it really ripped apart forensic science and questioned whether there was any science in any given forensic science discipline. And we've come a long way. Um, if you have not read this report, please do. It is a really excellent report. It's a great primer. If you don't know anything about say toxicology, it will tell you what toxicology is what's good about it and where the weaknesses lie. 
So I, I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, no, it had nothing to do with, with APHIS. There was no APHIS involved with Brandon Mayfield. It was purely the examiner side by side trying to find similarities. Uh, let's see. So some specific issues that that report raised with the pattern fields, fingerprints being part of the pattern fields, is, like I said before, the reliance on this apprentice type training and structure. You know, it's not, there's not degree programs. We don't have that kind of academic backbone. You're just trained by some dude who's done it for 35 years. The terminology that's used in the reporting, the matches, the like 100% certainty, stuff like that, that is not scientifically valid. Very susceptible to contextual bias, which I'll talk about in a minute. You know, basically what you're told about the case very much influences how you see the evidence. The collection and methods affects the evidence that you're gonna deal with. Um, so there's, um, again, you know, it's not like, uh, say, drugs where, you know, you're using kind of known chemical uh, techniques and you're not kind of damaging your evidence from the very beginning, which, you know, with fingerprints, you could damage your evidence before you even have a chance to examine it. It's largely experience based and there is no consensus on the number of features, the number of minutia that are needed to declare that it's a match. And even today, we don't know whether it's eight or 12. I mean, Way back in the 1800s, it was kind of statistically proven that 12 is sufficient for, you know, to declare a source conclusion. But what was happening is there were some marks that only had 11 and very certain that this was a source conclusion, but because it didn't ma make that magic number, they wouldn't be able to use it. So that magic number has now gone away and yeah, there's this lack of consensus. So the next report that came along was the PCAST report in 2016. Its sole focus was on the pattern type fields. It really honed in on the hair, the bite marks, the handwriting, basically saying those fields were garbage. It praised the advances in fingerprints and firearms evidence that had happened since 2009, but it also recognizes that there's still work that needs to be done. So the Daubert standard, I just have a couple of um, Articles here that you might want to read. I'm sure that uh, Marissa will distribute my slides to everybody after the fact so that you can look these up. But these talk about kind of fingerprints within uh, Daubert. Apparently, you know, I just learned this myself as I was preparing. Uh, there have been at least 40 Daubert challenges to fingerprints, and fingerprints have survived every single one. Um, Marissa, do you uh, do you want to say a couple words about that that the first case? No, I think. Um... Folks are probably very yeah. familiar with it and I wanna focus yeah. on you. Okay, so um, in terms of where we're still lacking in Daubert with fingerprints, we really still don't know our error rates. We have not made it, it there yet in terms of Daubert. Um, and you know, we could really argue the existence and maintenance of standards still in terms of how we're actually processing fingerprints once they're in the laboratory. Do you know of any comparative reports between the US and UK? No, I don't. Um, no, I don't off the top of my head, but there was a seminal case in the UK called the Mackay case, uh, which is very much like their Brandon Mayfield case where it split the fingerprint community. Was this a match? Was this not a match? And it actually led to an inquiry within um, the Houses of Parliament. And there is a final report from that inquiry and that would probably be a really good place to start. So I can look that up for somebody afterwards. So some considerations when you're dealing with fingerprint uh, evidence, really look at the terminology that's used when they make their conclusion. Do they say a match? I will show you, I'll show some red flag statements that you should really look out for. What was the quality of the mark that they were examining? You know, was it super partial? Was it super grainy where they had to make a lot of judgment calls as to whether this was a, a, a ridge variation or not? How do they explain any disagreements between the two marks? Are there disagreements between the two marks? Do they, do they just gloss over them or do they you know, provide some sort of explanation? Again, ACEV is not a methodology. How is the comparison actually presented? Is there an image that shows 
how they came to that result. I mean, in my opinion, there should be, otherwise I'm just taking your word for it. So a core scientific principle is the idea of reproducibility, that two independent people should be able to follow the same methodology with the same source material and come to the same conclusion. If there is no fingerprint presented in that report, there is no ability for reproducibility. I cannot, I cannot see how you came to your conclusion to agree whether I would come to the same conclusion. Also, was a verification conducted? And how was it conducted? Was it just you know Joe in the office that did it? Or was it an actual blind independent verification? Or was there no verification at all, which is usually what happens. Some other questions that you should ask when reviewing those transcripts, how was the evidence collected and processed? That really is gonna determine your source material. Question their training, like, Again, were they just trained by Bob in the office or you know, do they actually know something about science? Uh, are they subjected to competency testing? Again, probably not. What kind of certifications do they have? These are all questions relating to the reliability of the evidence that they produced. Um, if they did competency testing, what was the error rate? How was that error rate determined? Um, but again, probably, particularly for the, the, the fact that you guys are dealing with older cases, there's not gonna be any kind of competency testing. Question the methods that they used. Again, this comes down to the validity of their um, ultimate conclusion and whether it's verifiable. Do they actually walk you through the process that they took? Again, usually not. Usually it's just like, oh yeah, these fingerprints were the same. All right, well, like, again, how did you come to that conclusion? What did you look at? You can question their background knowledge. One of the first innocence cases that I worked on, reading the transcripts, it was just factually wrong. You know, they said that Galton was around in the 1700s. He absolutely was not. That was a hundred years before he was born. So again, if you want to talk about reliability and they don't know the, like their basic fingerprint facts, yeah, that's kind of a problem in my, in my opinion. Um, question how the evidence was presented to the jury. Again, when I present evidence, I put both of those marks on a screen and I go point by point on how I came to that conclusion. Otherwise, again, it's a Dixit, you're just taking their word for it. You're just, you know, saying, okay, I believe you, you've shown me no proof that this is a conclusion, but all right. Those red flag statements, they should not be saying match. I'll give an example of, of why. Um, this is an example I give with my students. Let's say you're at Fashion Week in New York City and the model is walking down the runway and everyone's taking pictures and stuff like that. You'll have a hundred pictures of that model. None of those pictures are gonna match. Every single picture, the lighting's gonna be different. She's gonna be turned a different way. The wind's blowing her hair, whatever. You can say it's the same model. There are features that you can compare across images to say it's the same person, but none of those images actually match. It's the same thing with fingerprints. Though that unknown and that known are not the same. One has more data than the other. One looks different than the other. They are not a match, but you may be able to say that they are from the same source. Things like zero, essentially zero, a negligible error rate, all that kind of stuff. That is all baloney. We have lots of, we have papers now that show that there are, there are more than zero in your error rates. 100% certainty, my favorite to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. That statement means nothing in science. There is no scientific certainty in science. All science is presented with error bars, right? Standard deviation. There's no such thing as scientific certainty. Uh, to the exclusion of all other sources, that also is a red flag. You have not fingerprinted every, everybody under the sun. You've only probably compared two fingerprints today. Um, the chance of an error rate so remote, it's a practical impossibility. Again, we've now got you know, good studies that show that that's just not true. So contextual bias, uh, I'll try to wrap this up as quickly as I can. I really apologize. Thank you guys for hanging in with me. Read anything by Idiel Drawer. He is the godfather of, of bias, basically. And on YouTube, you can find his 2018 uh, keynote talk at the American Academy of Forensic Scientists, where he actually presents to the forensic science community the fact that we're all biased. And he was super successful at getting that message across. 
Um, he does a really good uh, job of explaining what bias is, that it's not something that we, it's not the sky is falling. It's just something that we need to try to mitigate in our work as forensic scientists. Uh, this particular study in 2006, which is cited in the PCAS report, basically says that examiners might say it's a match one day and look at it again and come up with a completely different conclusion based on uh, the information that they're presented with. And that's what contextual bias is all about. If you've got information, that is going to skew how you look at something. I'll give you an example here. Here is a picture. If I give you no information, you probably cannot tell what this picture is. Uh, and just because of time, I'm not going to draw this out. I'm just going to tell you what this picture is. This picture is a cow. <laughs> my dad got it. Uh, if you can't see the cow, there's the ear of the cow, the head of the cow, the ear, the nose, et cetera. Uh, hopefully most of you guys can see the cow. If I told you right from the very beginning that this was a cow, you'd see it right away. Uh, and that's the problem with fingerprints is sometimes you're given information and suddenly you see something right away that you probably wouldn't see if nobody had said anything at all. The other thing about this is you will never now not see the cow. Every time I show you the picture, you are like forever tainted. You will always see the cow. And that's basically what contextual bias is. All right, so I'm going to skip this, uh, but it'll be in the recording. It'll be in the, the slide deck if you want to uh, examine it later. This was an innocence case that I worked on several years ago, we've got the known mark on the left and the unknown mark on the right. Uh, the examiner at the time said that this was a match, that these, these were from the same person. I was asked to re-examine it. The next slide shows my conclusion, but I'm gonna try to skip over it so that if you guys have a chance, you can look at the slide deck and decide what you think, and then you can see what I thought. So I'm gonna try to skip that. Uh, I've also included in these slides, quite an extensive bibliography of all things to do with fingerprints and error and bias and all kinds of stuff like that. So again, once you have the slides, you can have a, a fun time reading on the beach. So sorry for going over, but- to, No, 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 no worries at all. And I appreciate it. So folks, I did launch a, um, a survey at the end in terms of the presentation, but uh, Kimberly, if you can hang around for a few more yeah. minutes to, ask, to answer folks' questions, I'm sure. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. But before that happens, even uh, thank you so much, Kimberly, for doing this. I know I learned a lot. I stared more at my fingers than I have probably my entire lifetime. Um, but we're so grateful for your time and thank you. But if anybody have questions in the chat or you can go ahead and unmute and ask. <laughs> was Nancy, it correct? You know? <laughs> well, you'll get to see the slides. You'll see. You'll see what my conclusion was in the end. <laughs> but I have to say, I re-looked at it. Um, you know, when I was preparing for today, and I could really see how an examiner could think one thing once and then change their mind after you know some time had passed and looking at it again. So I was starting to question my own conclusion as I was looking at it a second time. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Yep, not looking like we have any more questions. Okay, great. Um, so again, Professor Moran, thank you so much for your time. We're very, very grateful. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.